Hey. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, first. We would like to really uh, thank you. <laughs> you know, I know it's been a long week, a lot of distractions, and uh, so thank you very much for showing up. Basically, it's you have one more session before the party, so I'm sure uh, <laughs> we'll try to keep you uh, alert and uh, make this a uh, valuable time. The session is entitled Application Lifecycle Management, Project Server and Team Foundation Server Better Together. And uh, today on stage, uh, I'm Ed Blankenship. I'm a Visual Studio ALM and TFS Microsoft MVP. And I work as an ALM consultant with Notion Solutions. Uh, I've got a blog at edsquare.com. Um, and then a few other of my good colleagues and I have put together a TFS 20 book, 2010 book that just came out. And then we've got. My name is uh, Christoph Feisinger, and I'm a uh, technical product manager on the uh, project marketing team. And I think you get kind of the best of both worlds. You get a <laughs> world renowned ALN MVP, and, um, and uh, myself from uh, Microsoft. Anyway, it's an exciting time because. Uh, Two months ago, we just launched what we're going to be talking about. So this, this is reality. This is not something, you know, we're still baking uh, back in Redmond. A chip, it's available. And that's the goal of this session. So here's, here's the high-level agenda. And one more thing, again, we realized that, you know, you've got a serious commitment if you made this session <laughs> at the end of the conference. So we do have about 50, uh, 16 gigabyte USB keys with the Project Server 2010 logo and the TFS logo. Uh, so at the end of the session, if you can, uh, whoever is interested, uh, feel free to come by and grab one. So let's get started. This session, basically, there's four sections in this uh, presentation. First, we're going to talk about the problem statement. And actually, it's probably a lot of feedback that you've told us, Microsoft, over the years. You know, why do we need to connect those two products that, on the face of it, typically are used by different audiences within your company? Then, just to set the expectations, we'll give you a very brief overview of what is Project Server and then what is Team Foundation Server. Let me pause for a second, but how many of you are using TFS, whether it's 2010, 2008? Oh, yeah, good. Good, almost everyone. And how many of you either are using or somewhere in your organization have a, are using Project Server? Good, a little All less. Right, wow. Okay, good. So again, the, the, the intent of the session is, is not to give you an overview of each product, but just to set the expectation. We'll have a couple slides on each product. And, um, and then that brings to the, um, the, uh, in the product overview, we'll talk specifically what is it that we just shipped uh, back in March. And then obviously with that, and especially after a long week, you'll see that actually the bulk of this presentation, almost 40 minutes of it, is just demonstration showing you what are those different scenarios that potentially you can use to, uh, to, um, to uh, bring value to your organization. Then Ed, again, you know, because this is Tech Ed, is <laughs> going to give you a glimpse of how you stand up that connection between TFS and Project Server. It'll cover kind of the key points that you need to think about, and uh, not just to install it, but also to configure it, to really tailor it to meet your uh, business needs. And then last but not least, I'll wrap up with a couple key links like customer evidence. And we do have a, a couple uh, with this uh, great new product and uh, other key takeaways to find out more information about what we're just going to discuss today. So let's get started. Again, just setting the expectations. There's been uh, different definitions out there on the industries of what is ALM. And for those of you that have never heard of it, referred to as application lifecycle management. Um, there's actually uh, a great white paper from uh, David Chappell that explains what is those different, uh, the three phases of application lifecycle management. But basically, this is a quote from the white paper that's available on Microsoft's site. And there's actually the link in the footnote when you download the deck. Actually, one more thing about the deck. I've been told by the, um, by the event organizers that uh, you know, the deck is available till tonight. So definitely download it uh, before you go home. I think it's a about a seven megabyte uh, deck, but it's got all those links. So ALM basically takes you from governance, development, and maintenance of the application. That's the high level when we talk about ALM at Microsoft. Going to a little more detail, what is the prime statement that probably a lot of you face? You know, I'm, I'm assuming that since most of you raise your hand that you've got TFS, you probably have some sort of 
a team of developers, whether it's large, small, whether it's spread across multiple locations, whether you're using Scrum, CMMI, Agile, or, or customized versions of those methodologies. And then on the other end, you've got a set of project management office, also referred to as the PMO, typically non-technical folks, but somehow they need some visibility of what are all those applications that you, if you're developers, are working on, and how is that aligned with, let's say, the big bets we want to do across IT or across all the business units that we've got to serve, again, if we're a team of developers building app internally. Um, and basically, the question or the challenge that you've told us over the years is Microsoft, you get a great product, which is TFS, and you get a great product of, which is called Project Server. I love using Microsoft Project to manage my schedule because I'm a project manager, and if I'm a developer, I love using Visual Studio. Can you somehow enable me to connect those two teams, and yet I continue to use the tool of my choice, depending on whether I'm a developer or sitting on the dev team or if, whether I'm part of the PMO, uh, using Project Server. So, and typically, between those two worlds, in any organization, especially this day and age, you know, you've got some accountability, and more importantly, you get some constraints. You know, you don't have an infinite number of pool of developers uh, that you can tap any day to build any app that was uh, due yesterday that one of your business unit asked. And, and same thing, and yet, you know, you probably all have some different levels of maturity on how you build applications, so I'm sure Typically, again, the, the team of developers are using some sort of agile, scrum, or some methodology. And yet, on the other side of the fence, the PMO typically are using waterfall methodologies. So what you've been asking us for many versions is can we somehow enable collaborations and communication between those two different worlds that are using different processes, but at the, at the end of the day, it's part of the same organization. And somehow, you know, in executives, needs to have insight into, you know, how's my mission critical application going, and also how does that fare in terms of resource capacity, et cetera, et cetera, um, when I, um, I'm developing applications. So that's kind of like the high level customer need. Let's um, dive into the uh, product overview. So again, as I said in the introduction, just to set the playing field, we'll just give you a brief overview of each product. Um, but again, there's plenty of links at the end of the deck if you want to find out about either products. So Project Server 2010 actually shipped pretty much at the same time as TFS. TFS came out in May of last year, and uh, Project Server, which is part of the Microsoft Office family of products, so whether it's your desktop application or whether it's your server application like uh, SharePoint, uh, we all came out at the same time, which is the same thing, of May of last year. So we've, 2010 has been in the market for about a year. And basically, think of Project Server 2010 as just an application on top of SharePoint 2010. And you can see on that um, yellow pie the different core capabilities that we add on top of SharePoint, whether it's demand management, you know, capturing, let's say, if you're doing ideation or change management or if you're doing new product development. And then we take that into what we call portfolio selection, which is how do I evaluate all those requests from all my stakeholders in a programmatic way and transparent way in terms of cost constraints that, my, that, my, that, that I might have, like I don't have an unlimited budget, and more importantly, how do I not only funnel those requests, but how do I staff it? You know, do I have enough DBA, do I have enough C-sharp developers in the next six months so I can do those 12 mission critical uh, big uh, software application that my uh, stakeholders or the different business unit have asked IT to deliver. Um, so again, we're built on SharePoint 2010 and just a couple, oh yeah, little animations. As recently as, um, as in December, IDC, which is one of the main analyst firms, um, has published a, um, a study and this is the quote, again, you can access, this is publicly available, you know, if you're trying to convince your uh, your stakeholder internally of, you know, what's the value of uh, Project Server 2010. But basically, you know, it's extremely positive and, and, you know, we've talked to a number of analysts bringing this particular solution, we're going to talk about it, whether it's Gartner or others, and uh, everyone's pretty bullish on this because, again, they see the need from you guys as customers, you know, connect those two worlds, uh, the world of uh, project management office and uh, developers. 
So a couple of screenshots just again to give you the high level of what is Project Server 2010 that came a year ago. I already talked about it a little bit, but basically we're bringing to the table what we call portfolio analysis. Forget about the fancy term, but basically there is a set of, of tools and features that helps you evaluate how do you make decisions, how do you prioritize all those requests that everyone in your organization is asking you to produce, and how does it align with, let's say, the set of key objectives or big bets you want to do as IT, let's say, this next calendar year. So that's a screenshot of part of that functionality from the product. And obviously, once you've committed to say, yeah, let's do those 10 applications this next two years or this next year, then typically you want to start executing, you're iterating. Again, it doesn't matter what methodologies, but you want to start getting visualization. Are you on track? Are you slipping in terms of schedule? You know, is this a risky project, et cetera, et cetera, depending on whatever metric. So here you're just looking at a, a screenshot of a rich client called um, Project Professional. And then on the right-hand side, it's uh, our web app, the web-based client. And you'll see that in a demo. What else do we bring to the table is, again, we've got this notion of, of resources, whether it's generic resources, which is typically your different roles in your organizations. You know, let's say, again, if we're talking about devs, maybe a C++, a C-sharp developer, a VBA, a DBA, an analyst, a project manager, et cetera. And we've got all that data. So then you can start looking at, at decisions in terms of do I have enough capacity, let's say, for the next six months? Is there potentially different roles where I'm going to be short of? So again, you know, you get that visibility. So as, a, as an executive or a resource manager, whether you're managing all the devs or everyone within IT, you kind of start seeing, you know, where potentially could be some issues to deliver all those things we've committed to, plus all the other things you've got to do to keep the lights on in your organization. And then last but not least, you know, you get all that rich project portfolio management data, those rubies, those nuggets, those diamonds. Uh, in, in the product, and we get very rich business intelligence and reporting capabilities uh, that we leverage uh, from SharePoint 2010. So again, I know there's, there were plenty of sessions about BI, business intelligence and reporting this week, um, so feel free to watch those if you want to get more information on those. All right, so um, if you're not familiar with TFS, I, I noticed quite a few of you are, are familiar with it or even using it internally. It's really all about software development and software engineering and getting testing done. Um, so you'll notice that TFS is not just an upgrade of Visual Source Safe. We, we still do have version control in there, but we've got quite a few other things. So things like requirements management now and test case management and automated builds for your source code so that your testers can test against those automated builds. Um, we also have something new called virtual uh, environment lab management, so you can manage um, environments that your testers and developers use and collaborate against with them. But you also have lots of different products that can interact with TFS. So for example, all of the Visual Studio SKUs that you end up having. Um, you can connect to it with Team Explorer, so if you're a project manager or you're a BA, you can connect up to TFS and look at all of those kinds of things. Um, it's very extensible. We have some integration with some of the Office products like Excel and Project. Um, Project Server is the one we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and then there's also some integration with SharePoint as well. So Project Server is really good about the schedule, the portfolio analysis, what do we work on, what resources are available. And TFS is really good about actually getting it done, getting your applications done from end to end. So one of the major things that we'll talk about, so we do have automated builds and test case management and all of those kinds of things, but the key player with the integration between Project Server and TFS is about work item integration. So not only your requirements or your user stories and your tasks, all of that information can go between TFS and Project Server. So in this particular example, we've got um, parent-child hierarchy of our requirements um, straight inside of Visual Studio. So you can take a look at those, open, open it up in Visual Studio, kind of get the details of what those requirements are. But you can then, from those requirements, have traceability down into the work that actually gets done. So you would create children tasks from those requirements. Um, and we could say, you know, this is the database schema changes, or these are the UI, or this is test case planning. Um, those kinds of tasks that implement that particular requirement. 
Um, I mentioned a minute ago that there is some integration with some of the Office products. So if you're not comfortable with working inside of Visual Studio, you can actually pick your tool of choice and work with the information in there. So for example, we're gonna do this in the demo, but there's several um, ways of using Excel to actually look at those work items and, and even update them and get uh, refreshed information straight back from TFS, so it's really cool. We'll do that in the demo as well. Um, one of the key pieces between the integration is that TFS also knows about how to track actuals and, and completed work and remaining work. Um, and where that's really useful is all that data in rich, rich information gets pumped into the warehouse. And we also can get dashboards and business intelligence and rich reporting out of it. So this happens to be um, some of the integration in SharePoint. It leverages Excel services behind the scenes. And you're seeing um, the first chart up there is, is essentially the remaining work and completed work. And if you're familiar with some of the Agile principles, this is a burn down chart. So um, we can able to, we're able to get that information straight from TFS. So we've got lots of other rich reporting. So if you're doing iterative development, we can see our actuals versus our estimates, uh, number of open bugs per iteration, that kind of thing. And then one of my favorite reports is how to track all of that traceability back to those requirements or those user stories. So in this particular example, it, it's a lot of information, but it's really that high level dashboard of saying, how much work have we done against a particular requirement? What's our testing progress? So you'll see that second column is passing, failing test cases versus test cases that have never even been run yet. And then how many open bugs do we have per requirement too? So we've got lots of rich reporting in TFS. So this is really, we're focused on just the work item tracking part of TFS. And with that, we can now integrate the two. <laughs> yeah, so what did we, oops. <laughs> what did we just ship? So it's got a lengthy name, but again, it's called a Team Foundation Server 2010 and Project Server 2010 Integration Feature Pack. The key takeaways is that, you know, it's something the engineering team ship, meaning this is not a codeplex, uh, open source, non-supported by Microsoft solution. It's documented. And you know, you know, we'll give you pointers. There's a lot of documentation on MSDN on how to set it up on those different scenarios from a business perspective. It's localized, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, this is really about, you know, again, in the world of TFS, it's work items. And in the world of project, it's called tasks, typically the granularity of the bucket where you're tracking work. So we're literally connecting those two entities between both systems. Oops. <laughs> so anyway, I. I put this uh, little diagram. Again, it's a bridge. It's a bi-directional bridge. And you'll see, actually, when uh, Ed talks about the, um, the configuration, you'll see how you can really, really tailor the bridge in terms of what, what information is going back and forth between those two systems so you can really tailor it to your own um, processes. This slide, I'm not going to talk about it. The one takeaway is, again, I told you we shipped this product back in uh, March. And actually, less than a month ago, in April, we also uh, shipped a uh, demo virtual machine. So again, you can experience that. And this demo virtual machine is exactly what we'll be using today. So if you like what you see, then when you go back in the office, you know, start downloading the bits, set it up on a, on a virtual environment, and we've delivered with it a set of scripts. And we'll also have a set of videos on channel nine. So again, before maybe you download the VM or while it's downloaded, maybe you want to watch the videos one more time by in the high def, et cetera, et cetera. So it, anyway, the goal was to really tell some of those stories so you start seeing the value and how potentially uh, this could be a benefit within your organization. So let's get started. All right, we're about to demo time. So, all right, so the first thing, just to set the stage a little bit is we basically got our two offices, our development office and we've got our project management office. And the development team wants to practice one of the many different Agile methodologies. In this case, we're gonna um, practice Scrum. And they go through their own processes, but one of the big things is the project management office wants to get visibility into what the Agile development teams are doing. So we're going to show um, how to give that visibility over to the PML. So let's switch over here. Let's see, we've got C. All good. All right, that looks good. Okay. What we're gonna do is, I'm gonna be the development lead as Peter 
And Christoph is going to be our project manager, Lena. And we're going to go back and forth and uh, show each other all of our different information as we go through. So I've opened up Visual Studio. This is Visual Studio 2010. Um, we've got the Service Pack 1 installed on it. And what we've got here is inside of um, TFS, you've got a Team Explorer window inside of Visual Studio that connects back to TFS. And you can see we can get to our source code, our automated builds. We'll talk about documents in a minute. But really, we're, um, we can see all of the different work items. So if I want to look at my bugs or my tasks or my test cases or any of the other team's um, information, we could do that. But the one I'm going to look at really quickly here is the iteration backlog. So if you're familiar with um, any of the Agile methodologies, you have what's called an iteration backlog that has your current work for this particular iteration in here. So if I take a look here, you can start to see that rich parent-child relationship between our user stories. So if you're not familiar with what user stories are, they're essentially requirements. They're Agile requirements. And then the tasks that are broken down to actually implement that particular user story. So if I open any of these, we can get um, information about them here. Um, but sometimes you really like to use Excel. You know how to use Excel. So what we can do is there's actually what are called agile planning workbooks that will connect back to TFS um, and use that work item query. And we can do a lot of rich stuff with it. So, this documents node is actually a documents library. It shows all of the documents libraries that are in a SharePoint site that are tied to this particular uh, team project. But we don't have to go to SharePoint to get to it. It's exposed right in the tool that we use as developers. So I'll open this up, um, this iteration backlog here. Give it a second. Um, but essentially, yes, did you have a question? Yes, they, they would. So the question was, are these um, documents default with a template? So um, yes, as soon as you create a new team project in, in TFS, it'll upload any of these SharePoint documents that come straight from the, the process and, template. And this is the Agile out-of-the-box template? Yes. In another, in the second scenario, I'll be using the, the CMMI out-of-the-box template. It's more of a traditional process. So you can actually have custom processes internally. Um, in, these tools work. It's very process agnostic. So if you're not doing Agile, this would work too. But here's the Agile planning workbook. You'll see on this first tab, we actually have um, that same view. Even it, it simulates the hierarchy inside of Excel. You can use conditional formatting. Um, inside of here, we actually set up what our iteration is. So you can give it start and end dates. Um, what is the iteration path inside of TFS? Uh, you can also s put in planned interruptions, so it's kind of helping you out a little with capacity planning. So David's going to take some PTO for two days, and also in this iteration we have a company holiday that's coming up. And then it uses all of that data that came from TFS on the first uh, sheet and shows us uh, all of our capacity by each team member, by the whole team. Um, we can even come in here and say, you know, David doesn't have six days of six hours a day to work. He only has five days, and you can start to see he's now become over-allocated. You can go reassign work on the first tab, and then it just starts showing up in here. But let's not do that. David has six days, six hours. <laughs> All right. Now, what we can do is Christoph just happens to like to see visibility and uh, who's doing what on each of these deliverables, these user stories. So what, what we need to do is we actually need to push over the summary details of each of these user stories over to Project Server. So what I'll do here is let me set that up. In the Team tab, which is what you'll get if you install the TFS tools, um, you'll get a new ribbon tab right up here. You'll see I can choose the columns on here for, from the work items. So one of those columns happens to be Let's see, project server submit. So I'm going to add that in here. Press OK. And you'll see it added that column and then it filled in all the values from each of those work items. And what I can do here is just say, yes, submit these user stories over. Now I can actually define the granularity that I send over to project server. Um, at this point, I'm going to just send the summary level because Christoph happens to want to work that way. 
and just see the deliverables. So I'll do this, and then it actually hasn't changed anything on TFS, so all you have to do is actually click publish, and it will send all of the changes up to TFS and actually edit each of those work items. So I'll do that, get that over to TFS. Um, and then we can even come back here to TFS and we can refresh the whole work item query. And then we can take a look at like this user story. You can see each of the historical revisions that we have. So you'll see I just made that change and there's some fields that are in here, but you can see every other change that happened. But if we refresh this, we'll give it a second. Every few seconds, it'll go and actually look for changes that need to be submitted to Project Server. So if you'll see here, uh, let's zoom in here. Those changes just got submitted over to, to Project Server. So you can actually see in the history when, that ha when that's happened and all of the different changes that come back and forth. So at this point, we'll let um, our PM open up their project plan and start working with those. Okay, so again, let's uh, switch role, and um, again, we're following the script, so uh, <laughs> um, so you can exactly redo the same thing. So Lena, the project manager, has asked her dev lead, Peter, to, to get visibility at the requirement level. So what I have just did is I just opened Microsoft Project Professional 2010, which is our connected desktop. Maybe some of you are familiar with Project Standard, which cannot connect to a project server. And I've got a push pin here in the backstage. I've got a set of uh, projects. And in this case, the one I'm interested in is called Tailspin Toys. Now, while this is loading, you can see here some of the new um, um, features of Project 2010, again, based on feedback from users is, you know, help me get started, give me the ribbon interface, which you're seeing here in 2010. Also, you're seeing that nice little uh, 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 color uh, timeline views and new visualization capabilities of uh, Project 2010. So it looks like it got, um, it got loaded. Basically what's happening, and the, the reason it was taking a couple seconds is um, it's actually validating the data that I've got uh, in my plan, and especially because in this case, it's a plan that's gonna be tied to um, TFS. So the first thing I'm gonna do uh, to follow the script is, again, another new thing um, of Project 2010 is called uh, manually scheduled task. And the notion here, which is again all new of 2010 that we heard from many, many, many people from many versions is, you know, I don't want the scheduling engine to be <laughs> in the driver's seat. I want to control duration, end date, start date. And that's what manually scheduled task means. Meaning as soon as I, I change that attribute, then the, it doesn't matter phases, calculation, delay, changes in duration those tasks are never gonna change until I, I say so um, by the scheduling engine. So, and the reason I'm, I'm doing this in this case, for instance, is let, let's pretend, you know, again, the scenario is the Agile team is in the driver's seat, and me at the PMO, the only thing I want is visibility. You know, I'm not really taking action on those tasks. I just want the visibility. So, in this case, I don't want it to necessarily impact my schedule. I've maybe those are three dev tasks out of a bigger program that I'm working on, which just doesn't depend on my dev team, but it might depend on other part of my organization. So that's what I'm doing here. I've changed that, and I just need to save and publish. Again, it's kind of like the same analogy that Ed went through with Excel against TFS. Our server product is Project Server. This is the desktop, so pretend our server is somewhere in the cloud and in the data center, and I just need to replicate the data from my desktop to that server uh, sitting somewhere in my data center. And just to get the, um, the um, so I hit a publish to commit to those three changes to the way those tasks are handled, and actually I just need to reopen the, the, um, the plan to actually get the latest data that came from TFS. And I, I guess I didn't pause, but those three tasks, those three user stories were at the bottom here. And now I'm just gonna move it because again, I just wanna track it, but I don't want those tasks to appear just anywhere on my plan. I just wanna put them on their iteration one. So here, I'm just gonna do this, scroll to task, and now I've got those three user stories that, um, that uh, Peter, my dev lead, in this case, had uh, uh, synchronized to my plan. So I can start. Um, looking here, you know, I, I those different stories, I can uh, pan on zoom on the timeline. But typically at this stage, 
what I want to do is maybe, you know, look, hide those tasks maybe in terms of um, allocation. You know, is I, are some of those resources over or under allocated? So one of the new things in uh, 2010 is what we call this notion of uh, the team planner. And the team planner, what it is, it gives you a pivot. Let me just go to the specific resource. And let's scroll back. And you can see that David on Jill, so each line is a resource, whether it's a name resource or generic resources, and pretty much like you would have a spelling mistake in a Word document if you misspell something, here the, yeah, the, sorry, the red highlight shows me that David and Jill are a little too much on their plate. So, you know, how should I potentially uh, address that? And one of the things that projects, um, the desktop does very well is, is leveling capabilities and look at all those constraints and optimize the plan. So to do that, I'm going to do a little leveling to address those um, um, those, um, those um, over allocation. What I'm going to do is change, um, I'm just sorry, let me make sure I'm, I'm following the script. I'm going to change the, um, the uh, Did I miss a couple steps? <laughs> I think I did. That's okay. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm going a, a step ahead. In this case, I'm doing the second scenario uh, instead of the first scenario. Again, the, That's okay. the Agile team is, is giving me the information. I don't need to take action or reschedule. At this stage, you know, I've got the information in my plan, and let's just save this. Let's just publish it. And at this stage, I'm just going to, um, one more thing I'm going to do as a project manager. Again, I got this initial estimate from my team of developers, so I'm just going to set a baseline so I can track against, you know, uh, a baseline, how's the dev team doing over time. So let's just do this, set the baseline, republish one more time, and I'm just going to close the schedule. Let's make sure it publishes, again, the, ensuring that the data goes from the desktop to the farm. And I'm going to hand over back to, um, to the dev team and in this case, let's pretend we're going to forward ourselves uh, in time and we're going to start seeing how the dev team execute on that project. Absolutely. So let's for, for fast forward through our iteration. You notice he actually put those user stories right underneath the iteration one bucket because that's where we've defined in our backlog that we're going to do these user stories inside of iteration one. So we fast forward, forwarded in front of it, and we've actually completed two of our user stories already. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to come back here to our iteration backlog, and anyone on the team can actually update their tasks straight from Visual Studio or as a team lead, maybe th during your daily scrum, um, you can get together and update your actuals in, in remaining hours of work. But let's say we got finished with these first two. So I'm actually going to just bring this over right here. That will let me say that they're completed, and then we'll say that um, there are zero hours remaining for each of those tasks. So I just finished all those up. And once I publish this, so we've got to change the work items again. It's going to actually go publish all nine of those work items and change it up on the TFS server. We can come in here, and we'll refresh this again. And you'll see completed and remaining on both sides of them. But let's take a look at this user story again. Let me refresh it a few times. You'll see that it actually um, will update. So it'll take each of those children tasks and roll it up to the user story level because the user story level is the one that we've actually sent to the project plan. So let's just make sure, there we go. So successfully submitted these updates, these status updates, straight over to Project Server. So as a developer, I didn't have to do anything extra. I didn't have to go to Project Server and, and do anything. All I did was use my tool that I use every day. So. Thank you, Ed. So again, let's pretend that a week later, uh, Lena, our project manager, comes back and open, opens the uh, plan again. So let's open uh, Tailspin Toys. And you're going to see a couple things. So if we just... Um, do a little zooming here, and you can see that um, actual work went up. You know, I have uh, 40 hours for this first uh, story and 28. I see that I still have uh, remaining work for that uh, third one. 
And another way, obviously, to uh, see progress on uh, those tasks is also on the Gantt view. You're seeing a uh, black strike on the uh, Gantt chart, which uh, represents uh, time phase actual work that is coming from the system. Yeah. So again, we'll pause uh, at this stage. In summary, what you just saw in this uh, first demo is we got a, a team where we're using Agile or some dev development methodology they're providing visibility to another part of the organization without leaving virtual of choice, whether it's Excel to update work item or whether it's Visual Studio where I'm doing it directly. Absolutely. So let's go back to the, uh, to the deck. There we go. Okay, so this uh, second scenario is uh, called real project status for the PMO. So the story here it's a little bit of the reverse this time. You know, I'm part of the PMO, and I know there's this big project we need to do, and as part of this project, there's a subset, a work stream, uh, of uh, a set of tasks that needs to be done by my development team. But I'm part, I'm a project manager. I don't have the expertise on what does it take to do this particular project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flag it to sync to TFS, but then I'm going to uh, rely on my development lead, Peter, Ed in this case, to give me a work breakdown, an estimate of what would it take to build this, um, this, uh, this uh, application. And then, sim similar to the first scenario, Ed does the estimates. It comes back my way. Then I'm going to set a baseline. It's like, OK, we agreed on this estimate for this widget. And then again, we're going to forward ourselves in time. And then the different developers on Ed's team are going to start you know, updating their work items, uh, changing the remaining work, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And again, we're going to see how is that translates back from, to the project management office. How am I seeing progress over time from that uh, team of developers? Let's switch back. Let's switch back. So again, this time we're starting uh, on the other side of the fence um, as part of the PMO. So I'm just going to fire up the, what we call the e-commerce site project plan. And in this case, you'll see on the TFS side, we're using a uh, CMMI template. So in this case, let's just, again, you have a project plan. I'm just going to hit uh, insert. And in the Dynamo script, we see you're going to build a shopping cart. And again, I'm not going to put a duration because the idea is I'm going to rely on my development lead to do that. You know, I don't have the, uh, the competency to do so. The, uh, the one person that I do know that will do that for me is Peter, the dev lead. So I'm going to uh, flag the task so it's as easy to enable the synchronization, say who's going to be the receiver on the other end of the fence in the TFS system. And then similar to what Ed showed when you uh, flag a work item to sync to a uh, project server in Excel. Same thing here. We've got a column called publish to team project when you install that, um, that feature pack. And here it's as easy as setting it to yes. And then the other thing I need to do is, again, project server natively or project doesn't have a notion of what a work item is. And in TFS, a work item could be of many types, right? It could be a risk, an issue, a task requirements like we showed earlier. In this particular case, um, I'm going to pick the requirement. You might be wondering, Christoph, requirement of task, how do we know about those? Well, actually, Ed will uh, talk about this briefly, but you can configure what you want the project manager to potentially assign it to. If, if let's say in my organization, I only want the project managers to, to bind the task to a work item of type requirement, then I can easily configure it so it might drop down list and it wouldn't be so much of a drop down. I'll only have one option, <laughs> um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's highly flexible. So in this case, just to move on with the, uh, the script, I'm going to set to the requirement. And the only thing I need to do is, again, save and kind of commit this, this change. And I'm just going to hit publish. And what's going to happen, again, the data is leaving my laptop to the data center where I've got my uh, farm with project server. And then project server is then going to um, talk to uh, TFS. All so. right. So now um, uh, our project manager basically has asked us to go ahead and figure out what, what does it take to get this work done? And who, who might I actually um, put on those as resources? So as a development leader, I'm probably not going to do any work. But he's basically assigned me the whole entire thing. So now we need to kind of shuffle that down because, you know, development leads. <laughs> 
probably don't want to be anywhere near code anytime soon, right? So, all right, so let's go through here. Um, I'm gonna actually switch over here. So since we're not doing Tailspin Toys, we're actually using the e-commerce site application, um, that, which uses this totally separate process template called a CMMI, Microsoft Solutions Framework for CMMI Software Development. And the only difference here, really, is um, user stories are really called requirements in, in the CMMI template. So if you're used to that, the CMMI template has that terminology inside of there. So let's open this up, and we actually have a hierarchical work item query that's called the work breakdown structure. And you'll see we have both the login module and the logout module that came from the project plan, but you'll see here's our new shopping cart um, work item. And if we look at the history on this, this was actually created from that project plan um, straight from project server. So from here, we now need to create our work breakdown because um, our project manager has asked us to do that. So it's pretty easy to do it. There's lots of ways to do it. I'm just gonna do it um, one of the ways here. I'm gonna say new linked work item. Give a second here. And then from here, there's lots of different link types um, in TFS, but I'm gonna choose the ch child link type, and then we're gonna pick tasks. So we're not gonna create um, children requirements. Tasks are the actual work that gets done um, to implement the requirement. So um, I'm gonna create a few of them here. I'm gonna create four of them. But if you guys have any questions, um, this is probably a really good time while I start and do this uh, work breakdown here, so. Again, while, while Ed is typing, you know, we're just showing, you know, using this UI, but you could be using other tools to start doing the breakdown. Uh, but again, the goal is, we'll do I've ever. asked the dev lead to give me a breakdown, and he's just doing that, where it's gonna take a couple minutes, couple days. Yes, question at the back. So the question is actually a very good question. Is project aware of the template that you use? And it's actually template agnostic. It doesn't matter what you use in TFS, and it doesn't matter what you use in project. The only thing that matters is you're setting a task. In this case, that shopping cart is gonna sync to a work item of type requirement. Now, what we did in, before that Ed is gonna be talking in the setup section is we map that project plan to that team site. Whether the team site using CMMI or a modification of CMMI or a modify Scrum or a modify Agile, project server doesn't care. The only thing it cares is what work items and tasks do I need to go back and forth, and more importantly, what data do I need to bring back and forth. So again, we'll be talking about you know, what is map out of the box in terms of attribute, and guess what, how can you take it further? So to try to answer your question, you know, if you're doing CMMI, maybe you want to uh, provide the PMO a field called state so that they see the same thing and they don't have to go look over your shoulder in uh, Visual Studio. So uh, actually that's one of the lab. We'll show you how to add additional metadata so that it's passed to the other side of the fence so that if I'm using Project Professional, I'm also seeing that state attribute. And again, I'm looking at the same data uh, where, wherever I'm sitting on the, at the PMO using Project or wherever I'm a dev using Visual Studio. Yep. So look, it looks like Edis is uh, done, so let's just yeah, uh, let's move on. I'm gonna refresh this, but you'll see now um, I've got my shopping cart with those four tasks. I kind of split those up between um, two members on my team, Edward and Kwong. Um, each of them are gonna be 40 hours. I kind of estimated up, but that's what we're gonna agree to. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you um, is we open up the shopping cart, and you'll actually see every time we, we submitted um, new children tasks, uh, it actually rolls it up to there, and you'll see down in the history where it's submitted those over to project server. But one last thing before we do that, um, we actually need to pick what kind of requirement type this is, um, and for this particular one, it's gonna be a feature. And then, since we have tasks that now break this down, we also need to come here, and we're gonna zero out the remaining work for this particular item. The work is gonna be done in each of the tasks, so. I'm gonna save that really quickly. We'll come back over. I'll refresh this just a few times just to make sure we get this over to Project Server. And the sync, by the way, out of the box, is a 30-second sync between the two systems. Yep. Any question? I think there was a question back there. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, 
So the question is, is there a relationship between the document store in TFS and the document store in the project workspace? And out of the box, no. You know, again, the, if you step back, especially for those of you that haven't deployed TFS, there's different modes of deploying TFS. Potentially, you could have TFS integrated with SharePoint. And same thing, obviously, project would depend on SharePoint. So out of the box, those are not tied to one another. Um, so it complete? It's all good to go. OK. So again, let's, you know, I've asked Ed to give me an estimate on that shopping cart. Uh, I chose what granular, granularity I want um, to get the visibility. And the reason I'm stressing this is there's another scenario we're not going to show you, which is how about if I did the whole breakdown in project, can I do that? Well, absolutely. Uh, but in this particular scenario, you know, I don't want to know the 100 work items. Only There's only four in this case. <laughs> but I don't want to get all the detail. You know, I'm a project manager. The, I, want, I just want the top line, you know, total effort and duration. But okay. if Christoph really did want that, I could have just gone in and told each of those tasks to go over as well. Yeah. You'll see in the, when you go uh, back in the office that the, it's scenario number two. is four scenarios with that demo VM. Scenario number two, we do the entire breakdown in uh, the parent-child breakdown in uh, project, and then we're sending all the parent-child to sync to uh, TFS. The beauty is, again, the assumption is, you know, I'm really, I'm the expert. I know how to do a breakdown, and the only thing I'm expecting from my developers is to provide visibility, but I definitely don't want them to change the hierarchy, the child, et cetera. So and as soon as I pick kind of this mode where I'm in the driver's seat doing the breakdown in project server on the TFS end, all the tasks are kind of locked down. You know, I cannot change the hierarchy. The only thing I can do is update uh, remaining work. So let's move on. So in the second scenario, because I'm in the driver's seat, I'm in the project manager, um, I want to really trace and approve every update that comes from my best friend in the development team. <laughs> so what's happening here is I've launched the project web app. And you know, this is standard. It's metered around for many versions in project server. But we got this notion of approvals, meaning you know, when there's team members updating remaining work or percent complete or doing timesheets, I can um, either auto-approve or in this case out of the box, manually approve each update so I can really be uh, in charge of, of the impact, the scheduling impact uh, from uh, progress from the different team members. So there's a set, again, I'm not going to give you the entire overview of uh, project server, but here is a uh, a tab called Approval Center. You know, it assumes that I'm, I'm a manager, a resource manager, or a project manager, and I'm seeing all those updates coming in. I'll just uh, select all those updates, and I'm just going to say, you know, thank you, Ed, or Peter, should I say <laughs> in, the, in the scenario. It looks like there's a couple more updates coming in, so again, I'm just going to approve those. The reason I put a comment is, again, you'll see all those comments that I'm putting in are flowing back to TFS. So again, Ed never had to leave Visual Studio. Next time he logs in, he'll say, you know, thank you, Ed, approve, or whatever. Or, or you know, I rejected that update. Can you uh, review your, um, your proposal? So I uh, approve all those things. The other thing I want to stress, sorry, before I move on, you might be wondering, how come in the first scenario, I never had to approve anything when we're collaborating with an Agile team. And the reason we didn't have to approve anything in Project Server, you've got this notion of what we call managed rules. And sure enough, in the first scenario, because again, the Agile team was in the driver's seat, and the only thing I wanted as part of the PMO is visibility. So it's not like I wanted to, there's no approval. You know, I trust them, they're giving me the updates, and I'll just keep getting those latest and greatest. So we had set an auto approval for this project, whereas in this, um, e-commerce site, I want to be in control, so I didn't set an auto approval. Another thing that you might be wondering, you know, that published that you still need to do at the desktop, can you simplify that step? And I'm very happy to announce that uh, this week we announced Service Pack 1 um, for Office, for SharePoint, due at the end of June. And as part of Service Pack 1 for Project Server, we actually enable what we call auto-publish. So not only you can auto-approve, but you can auto-publish so that you know, literally I don't have to open, I see people clapping, good. I don't, yes. have, to, uh, I don't have to open <laughs> the plan and you know, I, I literally, I can come the next day and I know that I'll have the latest and greatest data uh, in my plan. So expect when you get SP1 at the end of uh, June, uh, you'll have another option that basically when you go to this approval, 
uh, if I just show you that, so I give you, uh, will be documented. But basically, uh, you know, you have automatically you run this rule and you can get different rules by project, by resources. You know, maybe there's a couple people you don't want to auto approve. But basically, in SP1, you'll have another tab that says auto approve and auto publish. Okay. So look for that in the uh, service pack one for project server 2010. So okay, I've approved it manually, and let's open uh, the e-commerce site. So again, the scenario is I just got that estimate from, uh, from my uh, dev team, and you can now see that the shopping cart, right, initially at one day, I can now see I've got 160 hours, which is you know, the four work items with 40 hours each. I can see all the team members that get assigned to this task, and again, it's the granularity that I want the handshake with my dev team. I don't want to know all the work items that make up that shopping cart. But one thing I do worry about as a project manager is potentially uh, staffing conflicts. Yeah. And that's what this is warning me here on the left-hand side. And that's kind of the scenario I started in the other scenario is, you know, I can sense that there's potentially trouble here. And how do I visualize uh, those overall location is in 2010, you go to this uh, team planner view, it's a scroll to task, and as I say, you know, it's a similar analogy as a spelling mistake in Word. It's telling me there's something wrong here. And again, you know, as a project manager, you know, I, the tool is not going to force me to, uh, to remove that double booking for Edward on um, Kyung Wu, but uh, there's different ways to solve that. You know, I can either manually uh, move task around or reassign to, let's say, Dan Park, um, if that's, that's one way to do it. Um, in 2010, you can also level at the individual resource level. But if I follow the scenario, this time we're just going to use the uh, leveling capabilities of project server. So I just do priority. Mm -hmm. And you see out of the box there's a different set of priorities. And what we're going to do is we're going to increase the priority for those, the two um, logging and logout module. And if we go back to that team planner view, then we're just going to level all the tasks. And voila, you know, the system is automatically based on that priority. The algorithm is going to level that work for uh, Edward and uh, Kyung Wu. So let's go back in the Gantt chart. We've made a little bit of a reshuffling there to make sure people weren't working uh, 20 hours a day or whatever, 16 hours a day. And as a good uh, project manager, you know, I'm going to save this estimate. Again, we haven't changed the total estimate of 160 hours. But again, I want to do, you know, let's take a baseline. So over time, we can compare, you know, how we faring against that initial uh, agreement we had with our development team. Not that we don't trust them, but, you know, uh, it can't hurt. So I've, I've set the baseline. And at this stage, uh, let's just save the plan. And let's, again, publish those changes so it's committed back to the server. And let me just close the plan. And uh, this time, again, forward ourselves in time. And let's pretend, you know, we've been at Takedo Week, and uh, Ed has been back in the office working. Oh, it's probably the other way around. Ed was attending Taked, and let's see progress. Um, let's forward ourselves in time and see progress on that project. Absolutely. So you'll see we're getting quite a few different um, uh, items back from this work item. So you, you can even see, hey, uh, this was approved. Um, it's back in there. We can start to get some information. Um, back into to TFS, but one of the big things is, all right, so um, unfortunately, Edward came up to me, and uh, Christoph came over and said, hey, where are you at on this one? What's your status update? Any project managers ever do that? <laughs> What's never. going on? Never. never. <laughs> so, but we've done 40 hours of work. So Edward says he's done 40 hours of work on the UI di dialog. So I'm going to update the completed work field here to 40 hours. But I thought this was going to be 40 hours. But you know, our customer came back to us and wanted a certain amount of things. Um, it's actually going to be 80 hours more. So we've already done 40 hours, and we that's still have 80 hours more of the that's work. That's because you attended TechEd, right? I know, it's a right? a full week, right? Okay. <laughs> if I would have just been there, you would have yeah. actually gotten it done right on time. But so we'll come in here. Edward can come in here and say, I have 80 hours of work remaining, but I already have done 40 hours of work. So I'll save that. Um, this work item, though, is not the one that's gone over. It's actually its parent requirement. So we'll come back up here. I'll refresh this. We can come down to the shopping cart, 
And we'll take a second and wait for that to come back over. Do you want to show it the project like server tab while we're waiting? Oh, yes, yes. So once you actually set up all of those uh, configuration and you've mapped the project plan to the team project, you actually get a, a project server tab for each of the work item types that you've allowed to be a part of that synchronization. So you can come in here and see um, w if this work item is actually submitted over to project server, what project plan it's a part of, you know, whether it's been successful or not, so you actually can get some um, errors. Uh, maybe uh, Christoph didn't like my particular update, so you can actually reject those in the approval center, and so we'll see that here. But you also start to see what's been submitted over to TFS, uh, or project server, and then um, you can actually have other fields in here that shows up on the project server tab as well. Question? Single entry so, mode. so the question is, uh, you know, if I'm using single entry mode in Project Server 2010, which is a way of, of uh, doing time sheeting, how does it impact it? And uh, actually, uh, it flows nicely. I mean, the, the point here is TFS in this screen doesn't have a notion of time phase data, right? It's not like I'm saying I did eight hours on Monday, eight hours on Tuesday, and two hours on Wednesday. Right. But Project Server in a single entry mode it already knows what is the plan every day. So it's going to get that data, that 40 hours, and put it where it was planned. Yep. And then you submit it. So you can definitely, if the question is, can you do timesheets? Absolutely, uh, back in Project Server. And as a developer, I'm actually doing my updates in TFS, and those will flow right in. So it's very nice. All right, so I think we're good. Um, I can kind of imagine, though, our project manager is not going to be too happy about that particular status update. <laughs> So let's look. So again, you know, I'm, I'm in control. I don't want just uh, random uh, approvals or, sorry, random updates to come into the system. So I go back to the approval center, let's say a, a week later, and I'm seeing an update. So there's a couple of things that let's this time drill down, which I didn't do initially. You know, I can start visualizing that specific task that I know it's, it's, it's decomposing in multiple work item. You know, what's similar to what you would do in TFS? I get the history of all the changes. Um, and in this case, you know, if I go to the latest, I can see the you know, remaining work suddenly add, added 80 hours of remaining work. I also have 40 hours. You know, if I'm a visual kind of person, I can also just click on preview update, and I can see potentially has that slippage impacting my overall uh, schedule. And especially in this case, because I did take a baseline Ouch. at the beginning of the project, I can see that suddenly everything's slipping. <laughs> right? So that's one way of saying, you know, I, it's really going to have a very negative impact on my plan. Maybe I should reject. In this case, you know, I think it was important for Ed to attend TechEd, so he's really on top of uh, <laughs> the latest stack from uh, Microsoft. So we're going to say, okay, you know, fine this time. <laughs> um, and we're just going to approve it. Thanks, Christoph. <laughs> um, and then we're all going to open the plan, just see how it looks. Uh, let's open the e commerce plan. And so there's a couple of things that happen. As soon as I do this, uh, there's different ways to see that I do not have actual work in the plan. So first of all, remaining work went up, right, because of that slippage. What matters now is I do see 40 hours in this uh, column called actual work. You can all see, uh, see that pretty much like we did in the first scenario, project renders actual work typically by striking uh, on the Gantt um, uh, tasks. And, um, but we know there was slippage, so maybe again, potentially, uh, I want to take action because maybe that shopping cart, you know, I want to start uh, reshuffling some of the work that I planned, whether it was the dev team or other team, so I can start, you know, leveraging some of the rich uh, scheduling capabilities to look at how is this slippage uh, impacting the rest of the uh, plan. So I just switch to what we call the uh, tracking GAN, and you can see here, compared to my critical path, you know, what's happening et cetera, et cetera. So again, I'm not going to give you an entire course <laughs> on scheduling, uh, but the point is, you know, I'm, I'm starting to see reality and potentially I want to take action or not uh, and reshuffle uh, work or reorganize the different projects that I'm managing uh, within this plan. The other thing that also I can uh, look at is, let's just save this plan, and again, we proved it, and I'm doing publish, because I didn't set it not to publish in this case. Um, the last thing I want to show you is potentially, again, if the project initiated at the PMO, 
I want to start looking at capacity because especially if Ed is slipping, could it potentially have an impact on um, our plan within uh, uh, the portfolio of projects that I'm managing? So this is uh, within our project web app. I can just open the uh, e-commerce site here. And you know, here it's, we only have three projects, but probably uh, a lot of you have maybe dozens or hundreds or thousands of projects that you're managing. And uh, there's a couple of things here. We just got a little bit of uh, information here. Uh, so if I clicked on the schedule, uh, you know, I can look at the Gantt chart also from a, um, in the project web app. But what I'm really interested in is to go to the, um, what we call the uh, resource center, because I want to look at all those resources that, uh, that are working on my project, and I want to look at their capacity over time, because I know, again, that the project is slipping, so I'm maybe a little worried on, you know, can we still deliver on time or on budget? Yeah, I'm so, kind of worried about Edward, you're Edward okay. and Kwong. So let's go pick our, our two friends here. And again, the, the beauty here is that I don't know the exact task we're assigned to because I didn't want all that detail. I left all that to my dev team. But I do see them popping up at that summary level. So let's just go select those two resources. And um, in a project, actually, for many versions, you could look at what we call resource um, availability. And in this case, let me just make sure I pick the time frame where I do have data. Um, so 3.9, again, very well documented on the script, so I just need to make sure I follow the script myself as well. 4.19, and let's just click Apply. And now you can see, you know, I can, oops, I can look at a different, uh, different uh, time, time phase um, dimension, whether it's at month, weeks, etc. And, you know, I can look over time, you know, what is the capacity of those two dev in my organization, what is the availability, et cetera, et cetera. And potentially in this case, you know, they're only assigned to one plan, but if they, if they were assigned across multiple uh, software development projects, I can start getting that Uber view of all the allocation across the stack. So, you know, wherever I want to. We look okay wanna... here. Sorry? Look, I said we look okay here, so. We look okay, so. <laughs> um, okay, so this concludes this um, second scenario, which again, in this uh, second scenario we've highlighted, in this case, the project kind of got kicked off from the PMO lens, but the PMO didn't know how to do a work breakdown or software development estimate, so she asked our peer, Peter, to do that. Then I got the estimate back, I, you know, I leveled the resources, I took a nice baseline, and then let's say, okay, green light, let's go execute on that 160-hour um, project, and suddenly I start seeing slippage reality back into my plan and then uh, you know the the uh, iteration goes on and I can start taking actions and how does that impact uh, the rest of my portfolio so that concludes this uh, second demo let's uh, let's move on to uh, setup and configuration so you're probably all wondering that was probably a lot of magic behind the scenes getting that all to work but it's actually kind of easy so um, at a very high level there are a few things that you're gonna have to install so First one is on your TFS server or you're in TFS environment, you'll just want to install TFS service pack one. So everything that's needed for this project server integration is right in the service pack. Um, so on your TFS server, service pack one, that's easy. Should already be on service pack one. How many people are on service pack one? Good, 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 good. Okay. Step two, on your project server environment, you'll download from MSDN the TFS 2010 and Project Server Feature Pack. It's a very small download. Get it installed on each of your Project Server app application tiers. Um, get that on there, super easy, that's all. And then for your project managers, anyone going to be using the project um, professional client, you want to get um, Team Explorer, Visual Studio Team Explorer, plus Service Pack 1, plus the project um, client on there. So as long as they have that, all in those three places, you're set up and ready to configure everything. And, and the reason you need something on the desktop is you're probably, again, familiar where maybe some of you are using Microsoft Project directly connected to TFS. And it's actually the same code base. And you might be wondering, you know, how does it know how to switch whether I'm in Microsoft Project going directly against TFS or Microsoft Project connected to pre Project Server? 
And also, the other reason why we install something on project is, as I was mentioning earlier, is we're actually validating the data. You know, is it a work item requirement like we've defined? Are the resources Peter really exist in TFS? So, you know, I really uh, manage that handshake on there's no garbage in going on the other side of the fence. So that's why there's a piece of, of software actually running on the project's manager's desktop that are using Microsoft Project. Yep. So once you get that all set up, then as an administrator, you have some configuration steps. So um, one is get permissions correctly, then you'll want to say, hey, TFS, there's actually a project server over there, so that's step two. Um, then uh, you go through there. Now, uh, you actually have what are called field mappings, and I'll, I'll talk about what the default field mappings are in a second. Um, but you also, here's a key step, and this is one that people usually miss, is before TFS ever knows about a project plan, so let's say you create a new project plan, you actually have to map that project plan to your team project that's in TFS. It's a single step, that's all you have to do um, for that one. And then the last thing is, I, I, I get this wrong all the time, <laughs> is the resources, the users that are in TFS, make sure that they're actually in project server as well as enterprise resources. Same thing, if you wanna assign someone um, in project server to something that needs to go over to TFS, make sure they actually have permissions to see that item in TFS. And so uh, you might, in the work item history, let's say I submitted it from TFS over to project server, um, if that person's not in project server, to basically say, hey, there's no, uh, that person's not in the enterprise resource pool, you'll wanna have to go add them. So it's a common step I miss all the time, so. <laughs> you mean you didn't read the uh, documentation? I know, right? <laughs> Well when documented. you get like 100 resources, you know, you miss a few of them, right? Yes? They're, they're, they can both integrate with Active Directory. So yeah. Absolutely. So the question was, are they um, integrated with ADFS? Yep. Um, yes? That's a great question. So the question is, can I have multiple PWAs and multiple team project collections? So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between PWA and TFS team project collection. But if you have multiple PWAs, um, they just have to be one-to-one. -one. Great question. Yes, sir? So um, the question was, if I, if I created an Active Directory um, group called Development Team, does uh, it give permissions in both places? You could set it up exactly to do that. So you add that team into TFS, and then you can add that team to a broader enterprise resource pool. That project server can actually look at the membership of that broader enterprise resource pool and pull those in and, um, on a synchronized basis, so good question. I wanna make sure um, we also talk about the default fields that come through here. So um, in Project Server, we've got task, name, and title. So obviously, those are the ones that are out of the box. You wanna keep those the way they are. But you can certainly decide to add additional ones. So maybe you have other custom fields that you wanna make sure get in the project plan so that the project manager doesn't have to go to TFS to get that. So one of the ones that Christoph talked about earlier was actually state. State's a very common one. So what is the state of this task, or what is the state of this requirement? And have that pushed over as well. So you can actually do that, and in the scenario four that comes with the demonstration VM, it actually walks you through how to do that in both places. Only key tidbit is, I messed this up as well, <laughs> is if you customize your states, you have to also make sure that um, project server will know about those states. So out of the box, some of the state names are like proposed, active, resolved, and closed, and sometimes people will put you know, new or postponed or something like that. Make sure you also go add that to, to project server, otherwise it'll fail out there too, so just FYI. Um, and then just a very high level overview of the field mapping concepts is um, there is a field over in project server, there's a field over in TFS, but there also can be what's called a mirror field. And so that's kind of like, I guess you would call it purgatory until you know, it's been approved in both places. So you can actually have both of those kinds of um, field values be different until they're approved or rejected, so. And you can also control where is the master, meaning uh, like yes. maybe state, do you want the project manager to modify the state of a work item? Or, is, is, or do you want it to be able to modify from either end? and they always sync or just from one way, you know, so that's some of the 
uh, key takeaways here. Again, we're just, we don't have a lot of time left, but this is very well documented on uh, MSDN. Absolutely. In the last case, if you do have custom fields, you can have them actually show up on the project server tab using the configuration. So you can decide what things show up on that custom um, tab and which ones don't. So, oh, let's go forward. All right. Okay, so uh, last stretch. Uh, what did we uh, talk about today? But before I go on, as I said, you know, we've just released this uh, feature pack uh, back in March. And we're actually very happy to announce that we already have uh, two case studies. Um, one company out of Brazil, uh, it's um, uh, ISV SI out of Brazil, and another company you might have heard out of Renman. The point here is um, <laughs> the amazing thing, we did have a technical adoption program uh, last year when we did uh, gather feedback, also had all the uh, ALM MVP tested. The amazing thing is it didn't matter which part of the globe you were, you know, whether you were in Brazil, whether you were in Europe, whether you were in North America. It didn't matter if you were a small ISV, you know, maybe you're billing solutions for your customers or you're selling them, or uh, you, let's say federal, or in the education business, we had very large universities that actually use this. So it, it, the takeaway is that it looks like that benefit, that need to bridge those two teams was universal depending on the size, depending on the vertical, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I put the link, you know, we're actually working on more case studies from different industries, uh, so expect more to come. But, uh, you know, check it out today again if you want to uh, show some, uh, some proof to your uh, manager back in the office on why they uh, should invest in this. Works really As well, well to tell the story and kind of tell, you know, what is the problem statement, kind of like that overview that I was showing you on, you know, you get different teams in your organization, different methodology, but somehow you all work for the same company, so hopefully you're, you're uh, aiming for the same goal. So we've a set of white papers that came along the release um, that you can download, uh, typically the, for the two white papers are definitely non-technical. It talks about that problematic of, of not just bridging two teams, but two teams that are using very different ways of managing work. Um, Probably the most important link you've got <laughs> is the, uh, the MSDN. Not only has it got all the technical documentation that, that Ed kind of gave you an overview, but it's got a lot more. It actually steps you through the scenarios, you know, project manager initiating a request or the agile team initiating a request. And guess what? You know, we're continuously gathering feedback uh, from either beta customers, from some things we can do at uh, RTM or just feedbacks we're starting to get from the community of folks that have already deployed this. So the documentation is a living thing, and we're always looking for things to improve on that to this. And last but not least, if you've got questions, obviously we put our, our email at the top of the deck, but there's actually a forum where a lot of people actually that tested the beta uh, since last year have provided feedback. It's funny now that we've shipped it, and now that we've got a demo VM, we also have a lot of folks testing things out and asking like, questions, you know, how does it integrate with timesheet? Is it methodology agnostic, et cetera, et cetera? What granularity do I need to, to define? So it's a great way, uh, free of charge, to start getting, uh, asking your question, but more importantly, to get answers either from experts uh, from the field that are using this every day, but more importantly, from the engineering team that built this product and has been working on this for the past several years. Uh, Last but not least, it's kind of the end of the, uh, the event, so if you didn't make any of those, uh, you, know, you do have access to the recording, but there's a couple of se sessions on uh, Project Server um, as well as Hands-On Lab uh, during the event. And the demo station, I guess it's closed. Uh, one more slide, actually two more slides. One uh, call to action is we did announce recently that in a year from now, actually a little less than a year, we're going to have a project conference. Um, so, you know, start uh, booking the date or asking your... Uh, your uh, manager to potentially uh, uh, plan that absence in March of 2012. <laughs> so in summary, what does the Team Foundation Server 2010 on Project Server Integration Pack do for you in terms of value? And really, again, when we talk to customers during the beta program, when we talk to analysts, there's really t three key attributes that this brings to the table. It gives you insight. Back to, you know, I've got those two teams collaborating, but, you know, I, we didn't show you that, but if you want to build a nice, very rich-looking dashboard where you get the OLAP view of all your projects with maybe a green, yellow, red for your executives, guess what? You've got the same data 
accurate data, almost real time, 30 seconds lag. So, you know, it's not like the, the data is accurate, as accurate as you're using it. So you get insight, depending whether you're an executive, a dev lead, or project manager, resource manager. Second thing is coordination. And I want to stress that, because back to some of the questions, it doesn't matter if you're using on one side uh, Prince2, Waterfall, or whatever, and it doesn't matter if on the other side you're using Agile and, or your own methodology, if those two methodologies, or you typically you have more than two on each side, if that works for you, fine. We're telling you, you don't have to change it. But with this, you're coordinating some of the key milestones and phases on allocation, the decision that you need to make every day. And last but not least, as we showed you, we're telling the developers, stay in Visual Studio all day. Work on your work items, compile code. You don't have to go anywhere else. Even the dev lead, he doesn't have to go anywhere else. And yet, he's seeing you know, everything that he's passed to the other side of the fence, that they get approved, et cetera, et cetera. And the reverse is true on the other side of the fence, which is in the PMO. I'm getting the information at the level I choose to collaborate, whether it's the requirement, the work item. And I don't have to lose the, the tool of choice that I'm using and breathing uh, every day. So in summary, hope uh, you're seeing value in this. And uh, thank you very much for your time. We'll be at the attendee party. And please, please, please fill in your evaluation. We're always looking for feedback, not just on the scores, but comments, things we can improve, things you'd like to see in future versions. So please do your evaluation. And again, we do have a couple of giveaways. Thank you very much. Yes.